I hope you remember all about the cybernetic model of the viable system because this model deeply underlies the story I want to tell you now. We shan't see the model again, so let's take a quick rehearsal of it. Here were the parts of the organization, which I called Systems One, and you remember about their cybernetic interaction with the outside world. Those systems will go into oscillation, we said, unless there is a system two, which is this, intended precisely to damp that oscillation. Then we have our first corporate management level, the total organization management, dealing with the inside of the system right here and now. And in contrast to that, system four, dealing with the future and the outside. And then the task of top management, right up there, System 5, perceived as mainly being about monitoring the homeostat that connects 3 and 4. That's how it was. Now, the story that I want to tell you uh, began in uh, 1971, in the middle of the year. I had been going around using this model that I have explained to you in big companies, in agencies in all sorts of places. And then I suddenly got a letter which very much changed my life. It was from the technical general manager of the State Planning Board of Chile. Remember, 1971, President Allende was in office. He uh, remarked in this letter uh, that he had studied all my works, he had collected a team of scientists together, and would I please come and take it over? Uh, I could hardly believe it, as you can imagine. But this was to start me on a, on a journey which uh, made me travel 8,000 miles over and over and over again. I was commuting between London and Santiago for two years. While that model of the viable system is in your mind, let me tell you what happened when I first explained it to President Allende himself. Allende was a doctor, a medical doctor, as you may know. And therefore, it was very easy to explain the model to him in terms of neuro-cybernetics as the way of controlling the body. And then I went into the business of controlling the state. And so I said to him, let us suppose that these elements of the state are the big departments of state, like the foreign affairs and the economy and home affairs, and so on. And then we'll have those, and the following things will happen, and then we must have a system two, and I built it up on a piece of paper lying on the table between us. Then a system three and a system four, and I got that far. And then I got to system five, and I drew a, a big histrionic breath, and I said, I was going to say, this compañero presidente is you. Before I could say it, he suddenly smiled very broadly and he said, ah, System 5 at last, the people. That was a pretty uh, powerful uh, thing to happen. It had a very big influence on me. Uh, I can't go into that aspect, the political aspect in this uh, program. It's not what it's about. But I'm sure you'll bear in mind that I don't have to go and work in places where I don't want to be. What happened when I got to Chile and took over this uh, team? Let us look at a little diagram to show how I set about things. Politics, yes indeed. Politics is the essence of this. Although I've said I'm not going to discuss the politics, obviously essential. Cybernetics essential, that's what I'd gone to do. And somehow we had to make a political and cybernetic analysis and bring it together. Now, you'll see that I have written there recursive model. 
and not just model of the viable system, although that's what it was. And I want to explain what this idea of recursion is all about. If there is such a thing as a valid cybernetic model of a viable system, then you will expect it to operate wherever you have a viable system. One of the things you notice as you look around is that every viable system has parts, that's the systems one, which are themselves viable. And that same viable system with those viable parts is itself part of another viable system. This is what the idea of recursion says. Now, recursion is a mathematical word, and technically I use it in a mathematical sense. But the explanation I have just given is, is quite enough for our purposes. That inside every viable system, we shall find another. So, you see, I set out to model Chile in terms of its society, of which the parts are easily identifiable in big chunks. As I said, foreign affairs, for instance, internal affairs, for instance. And then recursively to model each of those chunks and so on down. We analyzed both society and the economy. Now, that's a bit lopsided, but that's how it was, because after all, the government is about controlling society. But Chile at that time was very much about the control of the economy, and that's why the economy got such emphasis. And what I'm going to be talking about today is primarily about the economy. At the moment, I'm giving you the picture. Let's look at the, the next uh, slide. The recursive model, how do we apply it? Just look at that mess on the screen. Under society, first of all, I designed those S principles there. There were five of them, roughly relating to the five levels of the viable system, where I tried to express in human terms what the cybernetic understanding of society is about with a view to propagating this knowledge among the people through booklets, through songs, through posters, as you see it written there. That was a lot of fun. I got into very close friendship with a number of the leading, uh, sorry, leading Chilean uh, singers, guitarists, songwriters. And I even wrote songs myself about cybernetics, would you believe? And that's how we tried to get that side of things going. We wanted to use radio, as you see. We wanted to use slogans, because the Chileans uh, were very aware of the role that these had played in the uh, Cuban uh, government. And then I come over to the right-hand side, and you see that word cyber synergy under the heading economy. Well, this is the project I'm discussing now. This was the project to use the viable system model in order to create a synergy, that is, a drawing together and explosion of a potential throughout the economy. This had been, by this point, very largely nationalized, as you probably remember. We had uh, at least 200 of the major firms accounting for more than 60% of the whole uh, national economy under the control of this organization I mentioned, uh, the state planning organization. And so we wanted to use these media uh, to promote our project of cyber synergy, to use film, uh, to use television, uh, to use VTR. We never got that far, although we had uh, plans well advanced. And then to close the loop, you see that word algidonic meters. I don't think that I had time in the last program to tell you about algidonics. Algidonics means pleasure and pain. And really, the intention of that loop at the bottom of the diagram was entirely to indicate that we had to get a response from the people to everything we were doing. And we made some very profound plans uh, to achieve that. Again, not part of this story and not completed. Two years I'm talking about. And I think you'll find that we did quite a lot in two years. Could I have the next slide, please? This is, indeed, the economy. 
And here you see what I was saying about recursion. We've got the state, foreign affairs, let's say, uh, home affairs. This one is a system one of the whole nation dealing with the economy. Let us make a recursion. Now we have the economy. And so on down. These are the dramas, the big major branches of industry, heavy industry, light industry, materials industry, and consumer industry. Four dramas. Then we can take a rama, do a recursion, make another viable systems model of one of those ramas. Now we find that our systems one are sectors. These sectors are what we should usually call industries, like fishing, like textiles, like iron and steel. So, when we make a viable system model of a sector, a whole industry, we find that the elements are enterprises or firms. If we make a model of any one firm by recursion, we then find that the elements of the viable system are plants. And this is how we worked through the economy, modeling everything by recursion, always against the same model which we studied last time. On this side, I'm showing the workers and their interaction with, uh, with the uh, formal part that I was just explaining. We have the body of the workers. We have the trade unions, which is CUT in Chile, exactly opposite, you notice, of TUC. I think it must be because it's in the Southern Hemisphere. <laughs> and inside CUT, we have the branch, and the chapel, I've used the English words for these, not the Spanish words, because they're a, sl a somewhat different organization. But I think you'll see, uh, you'll understand how, how that's organized. And then down here again, at the plant level, there comes this closing of the loop, this interaction uh, of the people with their work. This is where the action is. So this edifice we built. We had to make a lot of models, and I'll talk more about that uh, towards the end. What I want to talk about now is this. How do you control an economy? As we sit in England, we may feel, well, the answer to that is you don't. Probably you remember that when Mr. Macmillan was Chancellor of the Exchequer, he made a very famous remark. He made several, but the one that I have in mind, he said, um, running the economy is like trying to catch a train on last year's timetable. And indeed it was. His data were about a year out of date. Uh, not so long ago, uh, in 1973, uh, Mr. Harold Wilson gave his presidential address as president of the Royal Statistical Society, and he was saying that during his government, that uh, period of a year or so had been collapsed to six or eight months or so. Big achievement. Well, I'll tell you what I think about this. I've got a diagram up here which tries to relate in a very simple-minded way, I admit, facts and the information we have about the facts. As you can see, economic data is normally cyclic, cyclical. We, we're used to that. As you can see, we have a fact line doing this. And at these two points, exceeding the danger limits that I've marked on the diagram. The information about those facts, however, is lagged, as I've just said, by six or eight months. So what happens? What happens is that just after this crisis is over, you see here, things are now improving, we get the information that we are in for a crisis. Therefore, we say stop, hold everything, or take more money, take away money from the economy, just after the trend has gone in the other direction. If you look at it here, you see exactly the same thing. Here's the fact, you've been in danger, you're now coming down, you're going to be all right, but at this point, wow, all the signals blow, and you think you're in danger, and you say stop, and this is how, basically, I think as a cybernetician, we get to a stop-go economy. <coughs> now, these... Uh, features of information flow are met pretty much concealed by all sorts of things in the real-life economy. That's why it isn't as obvious as I've suggested it is. Nonetheless, I do claim to detect that mechanism operating. 
And so I say to myself, well, how do we get over this? Like, why is it in the technological age we are stuck with information that's six, eight months out of date and causes the government to take exactly the wrong decision each time? We don't have to do that. We have a technology which deals instantaneously with communications. And so when I got to Chile, I determined to make data flow instantaneous. Never mind making an improvement on six to eight months. The idea was just this. If we could find points in the economy at which to measure things, those measures would be sent every day continuously to computers which could analyze them and produce answers. Then we haven't got the problem with lag. I often say it's better to dissolve a problem than to solve it. So this is what we set out to do. What we have on the screen now is a typical communication center in Chile. We had a very, very big problem uh, to solve here because although there is such a thing as advanced technology, and many of you will know about teleprocessing and all that goes with that stuff. Chile had no money. Chile, Chile was being blockaded economically. What we had was telex machines. So there's nothing super sophisticated about this, but you can communicate more or less instantaneously by telex, so why not? So that is the kind of network we set up. All the dots are telex machines, centralizing information uh, through uh, one node and then a set of nodes centralizing to another in every uh, <coughs> kind of uh, habited place. I wonder if you realize just how big a problem this is. What do you know about Chile? I wonder if we could look at the map we have over here. It's a long, thin country, nearly 3,000 miles uh, high as, you, as we look at it on the map and barely 100 miles across. Up in the north there you see Arica and below that is a desert with a rainfall of about half a millimeter a year. Very dry, that's where the nitrate mines are. In the south where you see Puerto Montt on the other hand there's an unbelievable rainfall of two and a half meters a year hardly ever stops pouring down. And so it is that in Santiago and the towns on the coast near Santiago is the most beautiful mix of these, these two extreme climates you could possibly imagine. It must be rather like the Garden of Eden. It's always, almost always, like a, an English summer day. There's enough rain, but not too much. Sunny, it gets a bit hot in January, but that's the picture. As to people, they are very strangely distributed. There are 10 million people in Chile, and about 4 million of them live in Santiago and outlying uh, districts, about another million on the coast. If we add 2 million up in Arica and 2 million down in Punta Arenas, we've pretty well uh, accounted for the place. Nonetheless, there are towns spread all along that, and the communications problem is enormous. Well, fortunately, uh, that had all been solved before I got there for other reasons. There is a, a microwave link between Santiago and Arica, uh, and between Santiago and Puerto Montt, and there is high-frequency radio link uh, from Puerto Montt to Punta Arenas. And this was the thing that we mobilized, and now we can look at the schematic of it. Here we have it, the whole 3,000 miles, all coming to a telephone switchboard on a daily basis, all this information, going here to the cybernetic uh, network center, which can handle these data using, of course, a computer. Now, I have been very much blamed for doing this, <coughs> and I resent uh, the blame I've had very much. I've been told that uh, I centralized power for Dr. Yende. Now, this isn't the case at all, as I'm going to try and show you in a minute. Uh, these data were not used uh, in a autocratic fashion at all. Uh, they all went to one computer because we only had one computer. And if you've only got one computer, then ipso facto, you're centralized. But we were not centralized in the uh, political uh, sense in which this has been taken up by some critics. 
The next question we have to face is how are we going to measure things and what are we going to measure and put over this network? I want to remind you, because you've probably forgotten by now with all this excitement, that we have a model of a viable system and that it is recursive. This means that in a pretty short time we had made all those recursive models fitting into each other like Chinese boxes. And of course the advantage of this is the enormous reduction of variety. If you remember that phrase from my first talk, the reduction of variety that this involves. Because if you're using the same model for everything, regardless of the level of recursion, and can write just one clever computer program to handle data on a particular a loop of the homeostat, then you can use it at every level of recursion. And that's just what we did. So that was the first cut in variety. The second cut was this. We wanted to measure all sorts of different things. Production flow, thousands of tons of steel, uh, a few pounds of this, money flows in escudos, sometimes a uh, hundred escudos, sometimes a million, uh, numbers of people, absenteeism, social factors. If you measure all those things in their normal units, then you have a variety overload and you have enormous problems on the computer because you now have to write special programs uh, to accommodate uh, the, the, the uh, huge variations that these figures produce. Now, let's take a look at this. Here we define a notion called capability. That notion is not the same thing as capacity, because capacity is something pretty unreal. Capacity is something you never achieve. Capability is what you can do on a good day with everything going for you. That gets defined in the model, and this is the start of the quantification. Now, if you can actually do it, you can bet your bottom dollar there's something better, something I call potentiality, which means what we could do if we could solve some problems. If we could find a better lubricant, we could actually run this machine twice as fast. The machine will run twice as fast. Uh, we can't do it because of this missing lubricant. So the difference between capability and potentiality is in fact latency. It is latent in that situation that we could improve it that is an actual measure of it, measured as a ratio. That will indicate, of course, where to put a research effort, for example. And just as it's obvious that there is something better than capability to which we may aspire, we can also bet our bottom dollar that there is something worse, and that's what actually happens, because most of the time we don't even achieve that of which we're capable. And that actual figure, the one we're going to measure daily, can be contrasted with capability, which doesn't change, or doesn't change often. You have to uh, alter your plant or change your practice in a major way to change capability. And that ratio between actuality and capability is the classic measure of productivity. And if you multiply productivity and latency together, then you get an overall measure of performance. Well, now you can see what we've done. Variety reduction. We have reduced these masses of figures varying at all sorts of ranges, all sorts of uh, factors, to three measures, all of them by definition ranging from naught to one. So, as I, as I said, if we have a clever computer program which can, can handle figures if they're just between naught and one, then we can put anything we like into this system, in any kind of units you care to name, and handle it. So, that's what we did. Now, I want to show you something. And I'm showing this to you live on the blackboard because it's quite a complex argument and I'd like you to follow my hand and see exactly what I mean. Let us suppose we've been measuring something for a few days and it's varying like that. And now we've got a new figure. There it is. What would you say about that figure? What is it? Now, of course, if we... It looks pretty extreme, as I've drawn it. But if we go backwards a bit, we may find a shape like that. Now, what would you say? 
you would no longer say it was extreme. You, this is, let's say, now. So on the strength of that evidence, you might very well predict that this is, this is going to do something like we saw here. And that means that this point has no statistical significance, that it is a chance variation. Now let's take a second case. Here is the same series, roughly, as I started with, and again, the same new point. And this time when we look backwards, what do we see? We see this going on, mm -hmm. and suddenly we see a peak. Now, that peak in the analysis of uh, information is known as a transient. It means that something has just happened there, and so maybe this is a transient, and maybe this will go on like that. That's the second possibility. The third possibility, starting with the same series, looking back, we see this. Now, here's our new point. Maybe this is going to go like this, and we have an overall slope, which would be a very different case from the no no change, chance variation, transient, no change. Here is a trend. And the fourth case I want to discuss, same start, same point. Now look back, and we see perhaps something like this. Now that's known as a step function. It's been a fairly violent shift. And maybe this is going to be another such step. So, no change, transient, slope, step. These are the four possibilities that I considered for all the data which I was bringing into the system. And the computer program, which I described as fairly clever, takes every new point and computes the probability that the new point is one of those four things. Now, that's a difficult job. Very elaborate mathematics. It takes an awful lot of programming. It took us a very long time. But we did it. For those of you who are interested in the technicalities, it uses Bayesian uh, probability theory and produces an expectation in the future from those points, which is very, very sensitive indeed. It has this other cybernetic feature, that if, it, if the program finds something fishy, something suspicious, some high probability of a change, a slope, or a, or a step function, it automatically homes in on the data and uses more of the past history and does more complicated analyses. This is all automatic. So where have we got to? In two years, we had got uh, roughly 60% of the state economy onto this system. Using the viable system model, let's not forget that, to, to give the recursive uh, picture into which all these data fit, so that we can take our data, look at them, through the clever program, which is called Cyberstride, and then pass them on to the next level of recursion, re-amalgamate them, these data, in a separate way appropriate to the model at that level of recursion, and use the same program, because we're still working in the framework of figures ranging from naught to one. We do it all again. Let's, let's have a look at, uh, at how that works. Here is a, a system of recursion with a firm uh, which belongs to a sector. So let's say that's a textile firm belonging to the textile sector, which belongs to the consumer branch. Now, what have we got? We've got data coming out of the firm along this line. And I've drawn the line very thick to show that there's an enormous quantity of data. And that data is attenuated at this point by the computer program, which of course throws away any data that are unnecessary that aren't showing any kind of change, why bother with them? Throws them away. And the exceptions are signaled back to the firm. So you see what I meant when I said this system was not centralized? We signal the exceptions back to the firm, who have to do something about them. 
that is their management information system, although it's coming from the central computer. These data are then amalgamated again at the level of the sector so that we have um, our next level of recursion model of the viable system again pushing out an account of itself to this point, again getting attenuated by the same Cyberstride program with the data feeding back to the sector. And again, the next level of recursion, the branch doing exactly the same thing, and then there's another level of recursion, which I haven't indicated, which is the total economy, which does the same thing again. So that's four times this recursive trick works, always with the same data, at different levels of amalgamation uh, for different levels of recursion. And you will now ask, what are these things and what are these pairs of scissors? Well, this is the algidonic loop. I mentioned this word algidonic when I started, pleasure and pain. This thing is meant to be a clock. Now, what we arranged was that we discussed with the managers when we set up their own model at their own level of recursion, decided what to measure and so forth, we decided with the managers how long it would take them to act on a signal round their own loop. And we also decided with them how important uh, each uh, factor we were measuring was. And so we had a computable function which was partly a measure of importance and partly a measure of rate at which a reaction could happen, and we set that into the clock. So what happens is this. The data comes through here, goes through this Cyberstride analysis. The exceptions go back to the firm. The, the clock starts. As soon as the firm changes that, reacts, these scissors cut that line and no further information goes up. So you see why I said this was not centralized. But, you know, we need a system too. We have to have a way of managing. You can't just let the whole thing run and assume that everybody is going to do their job or is even able to do their job, has the facilities to do their job. And so this signal, this algidonic signal, may go up to the sector level if the firm can take no action. That at once is an alerting signal to the sector that some person at the level of recursion below needs help. And equally, a clock, a clock starts there, and the signal can go on to the branch. And equally, as you see on this line, it can go on to the total industry level and the uh, Committee of Economic Ministers. So that's the algidonic signal. But I do really want to emphasize that hopefully that signal no, is never needed. Hopefully, each level of recursion does its own thing using its own five-level model successfully. So, we've nearly explained how the whole thing was organized, and I hope you are remembering the whole argument about variety engineering that I used earlier on when I was talking about the theory of cybernetics. See, what we have done is to choose at which points to cut down variety so that it can get into the brain. Only people can do anything about anything. And they can't do it if their brains don't get the message. They need a huge variety attenuation. Now, in most of our society, this is done by accident. It's done by averages which swamp uh, those little bits of information that give you most advanced warning. It's, it's done by pressure, by lobbying, lobbying uh, uh, people and urging a, a point of view rather than by data at all. All those things, I don't have to go through them. What I tried to do in Chile was to use the model to design, as I often put it, freedom, because this system was meant to put stuff where it was wanted, nationalized industry, remember, these people need these materials, get them to them in time. These people need that, get it to them. These people can deliver to the public, help that to happen. All these points chosen and the whole thing given a management structure which could monitor uh, such a thing with adequate variety, using, I repeat, clever computer programs and not just 
talking about electronic data processing and you want some information, we have some, you know, a printout this thick. So now we're left with the final problem. I've sp spoken then about the brain and how the brain gets information. We've discussed the sort of information and how to attenuate it cybernetically. We are now talking about how the brain can understand it. Now, in the senior management of, that we most understand in our country, people are highly trained to accounting type information. They understand some economics and they are fairly familiar with balance sheets and things of this kind. I'm not at all sure that even in this country that is a very good way of communicating information to uh, company directors. Uh, it kind of favours the financial director and others are not all that happy with it. But in Chile, we hadn't got that kind of training at all because the firms were in the hands of the workers' committees and the sectors were composed of workers. So it wasn't going to do to produce a whole load of uh, statistics. Now, I have thought for a very long time that it would be much better, instead of sitting around a table armed with a load of paper and figures and so forth, if a management group could have a meaningful, creative session armed with real information, by which I mean the kind of stuff that is readily accepted by the brain, which figures, let's face it, are not. What is accepted by the brain is colour and movement and relative size. Things like this the brain is very, very good at analysing. And I have often watched company directors at board meetings when I've been a member of a board myself, accepting financial information which is being spoken by the financial director and making little charts to themselves. They are not interested in the difference between 17,001 and 17,002. They are interested in the ballpark of 17,000 compared with 20,000 last time. I built a room intended to service that kind of thinking. A room in which a creative group of people could go with no paper at all and get their information and do something about it. Here is a diagram of this room. There are seven chairs in it, and that's for a very good scientific reason, that one of the few things that uh, applied psychology has really measured is the amount of interaction that can legitimately take place between brains. You can't have more than about seven people before you degenerate into formality. Up to seven people, you can really fight it out. This uh, 270 degrees means that uh, the chair uh, should move in an arc so it can look at all the information around the walls. And what do we have around the walls? Well, the very first thing you'd expect to find would indeed be a model of the viable system, which is this one. I'm sorry, it has a rather crude version of my own name on it. I, I'm, that was stuck on by my scientists and I didn't have the heart to remove it. But that's what it is. It's the model of the viable system. And uh, over here are the exception screens I was talking about. And here is a huge information input system. So if you've got some idea in your mind of what that looks at, uh, like, uh, let us now go and look at uh, the actual thing in a photograph. There it is. As you see, it exists. Here is the viable system. Here are the exception screens, the, the first one uh, with the results of the Cyberstride suite and the second with the Elgidonic signals. This is the big information input. And behind the camera here, there is the System 4 screen. All this is about managing System 321, the uh, f future screen, as we call it, Futuro, is behind the camera. But I will show you close-ups of all those things. Let's take a close-up look at, uh, at Staffy. Uh, that's pretty familiar to you. There it is, the five-tier system. But what is not familiar to you is the following. That is in very, very bright color and is animated, much as uh, the slides I was showing you in uh, the last program were animated on your screens. 
but you couldn't see them in color, and it uh, makes a big difference. So there is the viable system that the people in the room are meeting to discuss, with everything moving on it, flashing lights, and you may be able to see some arrows uh, right up the middle of the diagram. Those are flashing on and off to show that a, an algidonic signal is in fact emanating from the third box from the bottom. Then you can see that there are blocks of color of some kind in the squares. You remember what they are, they're the management of the elements of the system. And those blocks of color, which in fact are red and green, are measures of the average uh, actuality, potentiality, and capability which uh, has been measured and which is the background information on which the management has to work. So when they come into the room, they refresh themselves with that diagram. They can see it all, all moving. They can see where special signals are emanating from. Now, if we go on to the next slide, uh, we can see the uh, two cybernetic screens uh, from Cyberstride. The one on the left there ought to be, of course, driven by telepro teleprocessing, but as I said earlier, we didn't have the money. So, in fact, it's posted by hand, but it is straight out of the computer. And you can see that arrow pointing along and the one underneath it pointing down. Well, these indicate no, uh, the, the, the trends of the information that's being signaled. So that's the result of the Cyberstride suite for the level of recursion of the people who are meeting in the room. The uh, screen on the right is the algidonic uh, screen, which is uh, taking information from lower levels of recursion. Now, if we can have the next slide, I'd like to take a close look at data feed. Having seen the background on the viable system model and received the new information about exceptions, what is a manager to do? There he has at his beck and call information. The huge screen on the top is an index, and the three screens underneath are uh, what the index calls up. Each of the three screens underneath is driven by no less than five carousel projectors, each with 80 slides. So you see we've got a huge information capacity. Take a look at uh, what is on the left-hand screen there. The there was a flowchart on the left-hand screen. There it is. The flowchart on the left-hand screen, I would like to show you in close-up, if we could have the next slide. There is a very simple flowchart of the form which we adopted for people really to understand. Those things are all in color. The lines, of course, show the flows, and the thickness of the line shows the relative flow. The boxes have colors in them to show what the productivity index is and what the latency index is. Now, I put that one on to show you something terribly simple to get the idea. Let's look at a more complicated one. This next one shows a chemical plant dealing with uh, gasoline and so forth, and you see it's a good deal more complicated. And on the, the next one, I won't dwell on this, uh, we have hundreds of them, of course, that actually is one uh, about forest products and the making of furniture. But I think you can see how very quickly the brain can appreciate what is going on. And if you were the Minister of Economics and had no idea about the flows of uh, material that were needed to produce furniture, that gives you a very quick notion of the answer. So, if, we, uh, if you remember the, the whole of this picture, we were just looking at that screen there. Uh, we can get other kinds of information on the other screens. We can get photographs of the plant. We can get a brief account of the, of the plan that has been made for investment. All that, uh, all that kind of information is available to get our discussion going. Now, how do you command this screen? Well, you command it from the arm of your chair. And you can see here, these are these three screens. And if I want to get information, I punch that knob, which gives me command of that, whole apparatus. I then punch this knob saying I want something on that screen. I look at the index. 
The index first of all tells me general categories and it has against it a set of symbols looking like that with perhaps the circle and the square marked in colour. So if that's what I want to look at, I punch the circle and the square and I get a new index of the detailed information that is now available to me on that screen under that heading. And by making another selection on these knobs, I get my actual picture. And I say to my colleagues, look, that's what it looks like, and I'm telling you we have to take a decision about this, and so forth and so on. When I finished, I press this knob, which releases the apparatus, and somebody else can strike his knob and say, hey, just a minute, I don't accept any of this, I want to show you something else. So there they are, no paper, there's an ashtray, uh, there is room for a drink, and there is a place for a creative session. Now, uh, there was one further screen which I told you was behind the camera. Most of that is dealing with systems one, two, and three. If we can uh, take a look at a slide, one final slide now, that is the Futuro screen on which we are simulating the whole economy. And uh, those of you who know Jay Forrester's work will at once recognize the symbolism. Uh, we use the Dynamo program to do this. Uh, let's take a closer look uh, at the detail there. I'm sure anybody familiar with this will at once see that valve and the little cloud. I don't think I will go into the details for those of you who don't know it, but the point is that I want to make is that again we are using animation. There are no arrows on those lines, as you can see. What there is is moving lines, and it really is a very dramatic thing to see. So, there it is. As I say, we, we got about 60 percent of the national economy into this system in two years flat, uh, with all its nervous system running out over 3,000 miles of countryside. And I think we achieved some things with it, though not very much. We didn't have the chance. You know what happened on the 11th of September 1973? The whole thing came to an abrupt close. It's sad for me, but at least I know that that happened, and there is the evidence to prove it. <laughs>